Recording in progress. <laughs> Evacuation complete. Yale Brothers, episode 83. When you're tortured with confusion And you're so alone Condemned to a delusion All your own When it feels the bed you're sleeping in Is trembling with your fears And the life supply of towels won't dry the tears Got to rise above it, rise above it, baby. Take a stand for what you are, rise above. I grab the hand of my soul, listen to the voice. I took control and made a final choice. That the life I lead is purely up to me I saw the sea so I can be set free Well it's no easy task To look behind the mask To see beyond the veil you do what you will And everything stands still And everything goes black you Try to get it back
Man, episode 83 on a new year. Happy New Year, Happy everybody. Happy New Year, Chris. How are you? Uh, good, Raj. We are the Yale Brothers. Man, I'm glad to be back with you. Oh, it's really? Almost Thank like you. looking at my mug with a <laughs> with a beard. Um, yeah. I'm very excited about this episode. Yeah. But before we get started, I just want to let you know, I think that's a terrific song. Oh, right. Rise th- above it. Thank you very much. It's uh, You were on it, so, I mean, yep. yeah. That I was think. a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, appropriate. Hollywood days, yep. Yeah, that's awesome. And the theme, Rise Above It, yes. I think is awesome. Apropos, shall we say? Yes. Yep. And um, you, I'm probably going to annoy you you guys with this long-winded intro, but uh, I'm nothing if not trying to be over-prepared. So, um, Take it easy, Chris, to tip it. I'm very excited. May I? So may, may you please introduce our special guest. Absolutely. Here we go. A while back on this podcast, uh, we interviewed our friend Casey King, the founder and organizer of the Addiction and Recovery Lecture Series at Ori Georgetown Technical College here in the Myrtle Beach area. The series is known for featuring a who's who of celebrity speakers over the years, including Lou, Louis Gossett, Jr., Lou Gossett Jr., Craig T. Nelson, Mackenzie Phillips, shout out Hollywood Professional School, yep. Paul Williams, Dr. Drew Pinsky, rocker Art Alexakis from Everclear, and Machete himself, Danny Trejo. Uh, uh, currently, Trejo's appearance was the biggest on-campus event in the college's history. But right this, this series retur- returns later this month for its 17th installment And Tom Arnold, yes, that Tom Arnold, kicks off the series on Thursday, January 25th. It will run on consecutive Thursdays through February 15th. Um, If you're a certain age like we are, you'll remember Tom from his work on the long-running ABC sitcom Roseanne, or that he was once married to the show's star, Roseanne Barr. And who can forget him opposite Arnold Schwarzenegger in True Lies? And... May I say the hilarious restroom scene in Austin Powers, International (laughs) Man of Mystery. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love it. Oh, yeah. Um, Iconic, dude. Iconic. (laughs) Uh, Tom cut his teeth on stand-up, which he still performs, and he has appeared in scores of films and television shows over more than three decades. He's also a single parent of a son and a daughter. I'd like to talk about that, too. And Tom, also in recovery, has been very open about his experience with addiction, relapse, child sexual abuse, and a series of health scares over the years. But if uh, I may put out, he's arguably in the best shape of his life now. We're happy to have him on the show today, and we're very excited. Welcome, welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, boys. Good, uh, happy, uh, whatever day it is. Good yeah. to be with you. <laughs> it's so excellent. Sir. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I guess I'd like to ask you if you've ever been to Myrtle Beach before. I have been to Myrtle Beach. Uh, I can't remember uh, the first. Did they have a Planet Hollywood there? I don't know. Yes. yes. I, Used yeah, to. Okay. That's why. Uh, that's uh, for a Planet Hollywood thing. But yeah, everybody's been to Myrtle Beach a few times. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful place, and uh, a very this uh, Casey Cakes is a, is a he's a go getter man. I uh, he uh, really is doing wonderful things down there, and he has been great to work with. And, and I'm, I'm finally excited to get down there and see you guys. Oh my God, we can't Fantastic, wait! Man. We can't wait to wait to meet you. Um, I love Casey. Chris loves Casey. Yeah. he started this thing in like. 2008 is still going strong, and I'm thankful that he put us in touch. Um, uh, are you planning on going in cold? Are you, uh, you on your keynote? Is it going to be off the cuff, prepared? What do you plan? What kind of ground do you plan on covering in your uh, presentation? Well, I, I'm going to do my uh, story, and uh, but it, depending on how much uh, time Casey wants, I'll uh, uh, you know I'll, I'll do my I'll do a, a good version of my story, my journey, the ups and downs, whatever. Uh, maybe there'll be a couple because you know we're ridiculous <laughs> addict alcoholics. We go through some ridiculous things, put ourselves through, put other people through. So you know, I'll just share honestly uh, my uh, experience, strength, hope, uh, and uh, whatever comes with that. And I do, I do, uh, I take my phone up so I can keep track of my time. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, one of my, uh, I, I can lose track of time. And, uh, you know, like last night, I 
did a set at the uh, uh, down at Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel down there. Oh, and, right on, right on. Uh, and it was twenty minutes, but I I bring that thing out there because I'll start something and and then I'll think how long have I been up here and I and I really do my best to honor the time. So you know, last three hours at Buffalo <laughs> and I do an hour. So there's a big. It's easier to do. A long in stand-up comedy for me, anyway. Long uh, set than than to uh, you know do it. Sometimes around here, like the improv tonight, I think I'm doing 15 minutes. They have a which is great for the audience because they have a bunch of comics each doing 15 minutes or whatever, and they get to see like sick a variety of people, which I enjoy watching too, because you know I forget it's fun to go out and watch comedy. It's fun to. You know, there are a lot of alcoholics stupid comedy. I <laughs> go figure. And I, I'll watch the person before me. I'm like, oh, they're doing all the alcoholic addict material. Shit. Uh, <laughs> I'll do it by better addict alcoholic material. But, <laughs> no, it's great, it's great to get out and uh, as human beings and uh, mingle with people. And uh, so, yeah, I'll be doing whatever needs to be done when I'm at Myrtle Beach. Oh, oh my God! Excellent, brother. Excellent. Awesome, Tom. Thank you for your candor. By the way, I happened to see you on Fubar the other night. Uh, your character Norm Carlson was, uh, can I say, likable and sinister at the same time? Yeah, yeah weird. It was a weird uh, uh, character to play. Uh, I'm excited that our strike is over, so I come back and do more episodes of Fubar. Oh, amen. Our- that was a question. Really great. Uh, um, yeah. I will tell you though that I don't ever want to think about bone marrow ever again. Well, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, it's a very creepy character and, and uh, very different than my True Lies character with Arnold. But many years ago, I worked at the Iowa Hospital School, what, what, University of Iowa Hospital. That's what was my job in college. Oh, and yeah. uh, I came in, you know, you come in in the morning. This is when I was, you know, living the college life, you know, and you come in in the morning and there'd be a sign on the thing uh, that said, hey, donate uh, blood, $7 or or plasma seven dollars. I did it all. Just seven dollars back then at the University of Iowa. You, it was nickel beard. Yeah. Uh, night. Hell yeah. <laughs> of course. So I did it. That I would do blood and plasma. I had to do it at two different hospitals because allow it. And I was very lightheaded. I was a terrible student, but I did. It. And uh, um, and, and one day uh, I came in and said fifty dollars donate uh, barrel bone barrel. I'm like hell yes I'm in. Oh. I am in there and uh this is back before it's easier to do this now oh yeah but this is some years ago so the nurses that all worked there at the hospital school were our buddies and uh, uh and, and one of them came up to me and said hey i heard i heard you're donating uh, bone marrow. i go yeah of course and by the way before i go any further they had donate sperm 35 dollars <laughs> one day and i got went home and got my five roommates because <laughs> i just prayed to god what am I get, what what am I gonna do with my life? And I saw came in and saw the sign and go, that's what I'm gonna do. Three <laughs> times a day. <laughs> and my roommates who are still friends of mine, five five guys, we piled in the car, we went down there to uh the University of Iowa fertility clinic. We come busting in there and the doctor's like, Slow down, boys. Slow down. Now, we don't take just any yahoo here at the U- University of Iowa fertility oh, clinic. Oh, oh, oh. We have to test your sperm first. Oh boy. And I'm like, wow. Well, mine's a little uh, sticky, but I think it'll be fine. But anyway, they tested my sperm, and the doctor came back and pulled me out of the herd. He said, I have bad news, Mr. Arnold. You can't be a part of our program. And I, I was like, well, why is that? And he said, because you don't have enough swimmers. Oh. I go, hey, really? How many swimmers do I have? He goes, you have two. And I go, that seems like, just uh, common sense, that seems like enough. <laughs> and, well, your buddies have two million. Yeah, so, what, the, what the hell, Tom? I'll never get a woman pregnant the normal way. And I got to say, I was disappointed because of the money, but I also thought, well, that'll be a positive when I'm asking women to go out with me and say, hey, and I don't know if you heard, I, but I can't even get you pregnant. I mean, worst thing I can do is sweat on you and give you a staph infection. And, <laughs> and then, of course, one, and one day I wanted to have a family, so it became a you know, a thing of a modern size. But the bone barrel, so... The nurse is like, wow, you're a hero for Jody Boomer. I go, no, I'm not really. I, I, whatever, I'll do it. And they knew something that I didn't know. And I went into the room with the doctor and the nurses and then laid down on the the uh, bed there. And the doctor 
turns around and he has a corkscrew screw like you know we used to use oh. on the farm like, you, he goes i'll tell you what this is gonna hurt like a mf yeah uh, i i could dub i could give you a low uh, dub your skin but it's still gonna hurt <laughs> it was like i saw that thing and i was like oh, God. oh my God, they're gonna screw that into my hip and it's a moment and we all have these life where you're like I could get up right now and run out of here, but I could never come back. Like I'd have to keep running, and and uh, I, my nurse friends didn't know. They knew I didn't know that's so how. I thought it was like you give some blood, dude. And so yeah, I did that, and oh. uh, it was a, a lesson uh, learned. And it's much easier. By the way, I, I highly recommend donating bone marrow. It's much easier. Now, you know, this is back in the days, back prehistoric. Yeah, oh, but is, oh my is, God, is, is that like a spinal tap or? Is that, I mean, yeah, it, well, a spinal tap is a little bit different. Yeah, you oh. know, where oh. they and if you grew, I grew up on a farm, so I've seen this before, uh, but not on humans. But oh. they they screw into your. They have a, cor, a, a corkscrew needle, a very a thick, and mm. it, they screw it right into your hip and take the bone marrow mm. from there. Mm. And uh, uh, at that time, that's what they. They thought, well, we get the best uh, uh, thing. This is a, you know, complicated. Uh, and I still have a knot on my hand from it. But, I see that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, they, I, I think when they do the spinal tap, it's not quite, it's a little more gentle, you oh. know, because I, I think I was treated like an animal. Like, you're, well, we got to get this. Well. So it was fun to start old show because I had done that before. I do. <laughs> if, if that guy, I think I suggested the corkscrew. <laughs> oh my god, I was going to ask you. And Good I did, on there, you. <laughs> there's no, there's no in the age of the internet and uh, streaming. There's no real spoiler alert. But do, everyone, do yourselves a favor and watch this episode. Uh, yeah, it's it's fun. And you know what? I did. You know, it, anytime you act in something, you're like, what knowledge do I have that this character? I thought, oh yeah, I know how to get bone marrow oh. out of this guy's leg. I'll tell you how to, to do it. I mean, oh. It's I'll do it the hard way, but because that was what was required for the show. Oh, God, I had Lord. no idea. Thank you for being so open about that. That's crazy. Oh. Um, I read that you came to L.A. in 88 after winning first place in the Minneapolis comedy competition. First of all, is that true it did to per pursue a career in stand-up? Yes, I had moved. I, my dream, I worked on the kill floor of a beat packet plant for three years up, up after high school. Be, to save money because my dream was to go to the University of Iowa and uh, and uh, they had a stage up there at the student union and I thought man I get up there I get on that stage you know six weeks I'm hugely famous and whatever that's not true but I did uh, I did get up there and I did get on the stage I thought I was amazing and yeah. uh, you know my friends would uh, all come to my shows 50 50 guys and we did Everclear Punch before I did my shows, which are uh, Everclear and Powdered Gatorade. <laughs> Not recommended for, but and what would happen is real comedians from Minneapolis, I'd come down, open the show, then they would go on. And uh, But the thing is, when I got done with my little set, all my friends left with me. So uh, oh, one, of the, one of the comedians that had a club said, hey, if you get your friends to stay and watch us next time, I will give you a job at a comedy club in Minneapolis. And I, I was like, oh, I'm in on that. And I got, so what we did, I did was I got a trash bag with my clothes in it. I didn't have a driver's license or a car. And I took a bus up to Minneapolis. And that was it. I was done with college. I was a comedian. And I arrived at the comedy. It was called the Comedy Cabaret. I went to the door of the place. And the owner, I, he opened it. And I said, I'm here. Uh, I don't have a place to live. Uh, is, is there, and I don't have a job, uh, but, but is there, is, do you know anybody that needs a roommate? And he's like, oh my God, you moved here? I go, yeah. He goes, I offered you a job, but it was one weekend for $15. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'm here. So I went to the the bar. There was a bar called Williams Pub uh, that served uh, 200 kinds of beer. I went in there, met a waitress, applied for a job as a bouncer. She said they needed a roommate. I had a hundred bucks. That's what she needed. Bam. And then, uh, then that was, you know, I did that for, Minneapolis had five comedy clubs back then. It was a great place to do comedy and, you know, and, and I had to work at real jobs, of course, for the first couple, but met a lot of people. That's how I met Roseanne there. And, and uh, right when I first moved up there in like 1983, so oh. 40, 41 years ago. And she was hilarious. She wasn't famous yet, but she was a comedian out of uh, Denver. And uh, we, uh, the comedy club owner goes, you guys will like each other. I want you to open up the show for her. I saw her, and 
and she was great and uh we hit it off and uh uh you know a lot of partying back in those days but yep. she was very very funny and uh i never seen uh a comic like her or a woman like her especially and she, she was amazing she's a little older than me but she and then she said she thought i was funny and as you guys know uh men we know we're good looking but if you tell us we're funny then you got us forever because that's a so we Keep ended up laughing uh, bro yeah we ended up working together uh you know we go on the road together she was in la and then uh, uh she had an hbo special last week to play her husband on it ironically uh in 87 and 88 with her tv show i moved out there to write the roseanne show wow. and uh, which was uh you know i got something i got to do for six years write produce act on the show and what a great opportunity for really my first real job incredible so, However, it ended. I, I, it was great fun. I got to work with great people. No I, doubt, I love brother. It, that is incredible. And because we're a little nosy, we grew up in Hollywood. When we grew, we grew up. Uh, you know the Magic Castle on Franklin. Of course, I just drove by it. Uh, my kids are like, "Oh my God, what is that place?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, well, there's a, there's an apartment oh, building right, right there. We we we, we we grew up. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, you know, don't okay. worry. All right, we. Uh, I'm always curious. When you first li- came out to Hollywood, where do you live? Well, I lived pretty close to where the kids and I lived now. <laughs> We've been downsizing. Like, I lived at uh, Van Eyes at uh, uh, Woodman and, and Oxnard. All right. And got a, a, a p- little apartment there. The a manager set up. And, and then, uh, you know, I needed to work a little bit. There was a writer strike as soon as I got here. Oh, God. So I couldn't start on the Roseanne show. And I didn't have, you know, like money. I'd saved up for my, my going away shows in Minneapolis. Uh you know, Roseanne came back, and we made made somebody you do before. But I knew I had to, uh, 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 I needed to, to work, so I needed to figure out something. But little place, uh, I, I drive my kids by it once in a while ago because they always want to drive by our old house in Beverly Hills. Sure. And, uh, and I go, yeah, okay, let's do that, and then we'll park out front. They'll go, you think they let us in? I go, I don't, I don't think so, but it's fine. <laughs> but uh, you know, and my kids when they say. Uh, my son, my kids are ten. My t- son's ten. My daughter just turned eight, oh, and, uh, and they say, uh, "My son's always like, Daddy, why, why don't you have a Lambo?" And I say, "Well, I could have a Lambo, but seven years ago I got you guys." So, oh, I love it. Uh, you know, it's a. We have a. We're very lucky. We we like it. But I live pretty close to here. Oh, it does get a little shady where I live now. Oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I understand, man. That's everywhere, um, man. I was going to ask you if you were like if you were willing to burn your boats when you got there. In other words, uh, were you prepared to stay in Hollywood no matter what? But you seem to have really yeah, 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 yeah. And I had a, uh, I had a, uh, uh, you know, a job too, a good job. But uh, you know, when it, when it the, when it started, yeah. But absolutely, I was so dumb and naive. I mean, the stuff I used to do because I love being a stand-up comic first. That I would sleep on people's couches. I'd work for nothing. I'd work for ten dollars. I'd work, you know, all it was. And I think of that now at my age. I'm like, holy shit! No, there's no way. And so everything was this great opportunity. I was excited about stuff. I loved the stuff around it. You know, the stuff when things did work out. You know, and I I met a group of like-minded people, which I highly recommend. And uh, you know, so I was just very. I was crazy. I was like, okay, I'm all in on. This, this is my dream. I'm going to do this, which it, which makes no, you know, I grew up in a tumble, Iowa. Now, yeah. people, people may not go, you know, my dream is to be on television or be in the movies and stuff. And my, my thinking growing up was if I could just be on TV one time, then then everybody in my hometown would love me. And that just turns out not to be true. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, uh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. 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 I just, uh, I burned a book the boats and you know whatever you guys call it yeah well that's, you know in other words no backup plan just boom it's astounding yeah. how quickly when i was we were we're 60 so when we there was tom arnold on the scene oh yeah uh, absolutely it, it's astounding how absolutely. quickly your career took off and the rest is history as they say but um i'd like to segue into part of your recovery journey which you'll be talking about down here in myrtle but is it fair to say that you were already well on your way to addiction issues long before you set foot in hollywood oh yeah 
Oh yeah, I you know I've been arrested uh, seven times. You know, uh, uh, I'm not the only famous uh, Arnold. My sister was famous before me. She there's a documentary series about my little sister called The Queen of Meth. Saw it, love biggest, it. Biggest drug dealer in America. It goes into our childhood too, kind of interesting. But and people were like, "Were you embarrassed that your sister was a drug dealer?" And I'm like. Not when I was doing drugs, I wasn't. Yeah. It, was it was handy. It was handy. You know? It was handy. Uh, exactly. But, uh, you know, but yeah, um, oh. I was a lot of alcohol. I, I would say since I was 12. Yeah. You know, it, it was uh, every, I mean, it seemed like everybody drank my age. It seemed like everybody, you know, you could go into the bars at 14 or 15. I mean, it wasn't legal, but you'd go in and you were mixing with a lot of adults. So there'd be, you know, fist fights with adults, which is now <laughs> I, I have kids. I'm like, what the hell? Oh, but our God. was a small t- that sort of ran that way, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of people. Uh, you know, not everybody that that, that drank it, uh, as a teenager became an alcoholic, but I certainly did. And in yeah. our town, you either drank or you did drugs. You know, you were either uh, uh, you know like a stoner or a redneck. Oh, yeah. There's no. And we're, you know, like, oh, well, I don't do drugs. And, and, and in fact, our my football coach, <laughs> who I'm still friends with, he just graduated from the University of Iowa. He was the MVP in Iowa. Then he comes down to coach us. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, I'm having none of that because he's not that much older than me. And so we got into a few uh, tangles. But he was also our gym, gym teacher, which I don't think he liked being the gym teacher. But he would go and throw six balls out in the middle of the basketball court. And it's for us to play Bob Barbet, which is dodgeball. And he'd go, Rednecks over here, Greasers over here, go at it, or whatever. Oh, that's and we would, go, we would really, uh, you know, he's a guy I'd become friends with later in life. And we both admit that we were maybe not at our best uh, at coming in, but he's a great guy, you know, and uh, which is a nice thing about getting sober and, and uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and but, but yeah, no, it was full on. And then after I left uh, my hometown, Someone, and when I moved to Minneapolis, someone said, do you want to do some cocaine? And I was like, I'll t- I'll, I guess it's time to try that. <laughs> and uh, and I, they gave me a bindle. I went into the, I worked at First Avenue, by the way, where they made Purple Rain, literally why they were making the movie Purple Rain. So I went in the bathroom, came back, and she said, okay, where's the bindle? I go, oh, no, I did it all. Oh. <laughs> oh well, I, I go, well, then we'll get more. I had my girlfriend's credit card. Let's and really from that point just escalated, and I was thinking, well, if I'm going to drink this much, I need something to balance that out, which is madness. Right. And it escalated, and uh, oh. until I moved to Hollywood, and and I realized, oh, people don't think this is co-. like people I'm working with are shocked. Like I thought it would be just that's what you did. That you made more money, you bought more drugs, you buy in quantity. But and yeah. uh, even Rosette's like, oh, wait a minute, do you? Do you do this every day? I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, uh, I thought you only did it when we got together on the road every three months. I go, no, I like to do it every day. She goes, that's bad. I go, is it? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, I guess I have to hide it from her. Yeah. Oh, my but, God. But, yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, but before, before you, before, Chris, what happened to me? You're there. Before before we go on, there is something. Um, I was stunned when I was watching Queen of Meth. But, um Obviously, money and fame have added fuel to this already smoldering fire. But in in Queen of Meth in particular, now it's been a while since I've seen it, but I recall your sister talking about one time somebody, maybe your husband, had given you a good bit of coke, and it was all you did it all in one go, and everyone got worried about you. Was that is that your mo? The more the better. Sure, for sure, and I think she'd give it to me. Now she would come over uh, uh, to my dad's house. We were raised by a single dad too. And I get Thanksgiving, and oh. there were six other kids. I was the oldest; she was second oldest. And she'd walk in the house and wouldn't even sit down. She had a big leather purse, and it had her gun and her drugs in it. And she would just kind of motion towards the garage, and all of us other kids would get up, walk to the garage. My dad somehow d- had no idea anything was happening. I think you, he what he just couldn't fathom what was going on yeah. with this kid. Oh, he fell down and fell naked, but. He couldn't. So we go to the garage and she'd say, uh, get in a circle. And, and she'd say, uh, what do you want? And I'd say, well, what do you got? And she'd say, everything. And I'd say, oh, that's that's what I want. I want everything. And so 
Yeah, you know, I told her I don't like doing meth anymore. I I, I think cocaine is the way I want to go. Oh, jeez. She got me some, then she saw that, you know, uh, I mean, she did drugs, and her husband, who was the biker, yeah, those, but they, she was also in the business, and uh, people that are in the business trying to build this huge business uh, tend to not be. They, they can be addicts, but they tend to not be, you know, because it seems like when she's making, under, she had an underground lab making methamphetamine herself after she got tired of working with the Mexican mafia, Oof. you think, well, there's a whole bunch of drugs. Like, I'm the kind of addict, like, oh, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to do it all, like, yeah. for real. So I don't think I ever went to sleep with drugs. I had friends that say, I'm going to save this for tomorrow. Uh, I was, <laughs> How do you do that? How We need to be up for five days. So Yeah, yeah. I, lo- know, I, lo- I, I loved I how pe- I loved yeah, how people I, would hide hide they, a little bit. I don't got to love the the my, guy in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> my brother and I were really good at it. Chris might have been a little better at forecasting, but that I to- we I totally get it. What about you, Chris? Yeah. Oh my God. Go so, ahead. Sorry, Tom. That was a question to ask you if meth was ever in your wheelhouse. But now you you've answered several of the things I've already wanted to ask you about. So that's thank you for that. Um, but let's talk about Roseanne briefly for another bit. You. I have seen or read that you credit her with getting you into proper rehab for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, um, you know, she, first she said, Oh, you can't do that every day. And I said, okay, well I'm going to hide. Oh, I, apparently I have to hide that. Yeah. You know, a lot of, uh, my addiction is hiding it. Uh, yeah. and I think at that point, this is 1988. I never again did drugs or drank in front of anybody. I did them. But I never, I realized, oh, I've got to keep this a secret. This Ooh. isn't partying anymore. People are freaked out. So instead of just quitting like a normal person, uh, I was like, oh, no, I need to keep it a secret. And then the next year, she kept asking me to move into her house. And she had his uh, house in Beverly Hills. And I had my little apartment in Van Nuys. But, but that's where I did drugs yeah. and drank. We understand. So I'm not, not going to do that. And uh, uh, But then I finally... Uh, gay bed right before we were getting married and um one night i was driving it it was in a, a benedict canyon part uh, up towards ball hall in there yep. uh, and uh the cell service is shit shit still shit yeah but which is weird for beverly Hills. anyway i <laughs> couldn't remember the code to our gate oh. and uh, so i had to go up drive up on top of ball hall try to get a signal got a hold of her and then as i said drive back down to the house i'm like okay uh, okay, this is going to be bad. So I park uh, there on bed and I see her car driving down. We had a long driveway. And I'm like, okay, I know what's going to happen. She's going to get out of the car. She's going to punch me. I deserve it. Uh, but she got out of the car and uh, uh, she hugged me. And it was a weird, you know, we talk about moments of uh, perhaps clarity or uh, uh, from God or uh, moments. And I remember feeling that as fucked up as I was. Yeah. I, mean, I was, you know, I couldn't remember my our own. And I think it was my birthday. It was the code of the gate. Oh. So I, I, she said, I just want you to come. I just want you to come, come inside. And um, so I, it was very kind. And uh, uh, I thought that something's different. You know, I finished the rest of the blow I had. I went stuck <laughs> down to the tennis court. Yes, you know, sir. Court. And the next day I, I ca- called a cab and I went to rehab. And uh, I went and it was quite a public thing. Uh because uh, one of my jobs at rehab was to go down and get the newspapers each day. And I, I go down and, and that's how I found out we had broken up and I'd been fired from the show. Oh, and oh. <laughs> and uh, so about eight days in, um, you know, something uh, that I never heard before, uh, my ca- counselor there, who I still see at meetings, uh, he talked about doing it for yourself, being sober for yourself. You deserve to be. And that had never occurred to me I, I i done it to keep jobs or look good or and pr- keep my girlfriends or whatever and i really I sat on that for a while and i thought you yeah. know and he said well, remember when you were a kid and uh you know for the queen of meth growing up and what it, does that kid deserve to be to live you know and i i got a picture of myself when i was four and i, I i'd carry that because i didn't like me the guy in the mirror here at all. And people are like, you got to love yourself. It takes a while. You got to try to like yourself first, then fall Amen. in love. Yep. And, but I can't picture myself when I was four, and I'd look at that picture and go, yeah, that kid, and that kid is me. You know, And he had nobody looking out for him. So oh. I'm going to, I need to do that. And I called Roseanne eight days in. 
I said, listen, I love you. I appreciate you. I understand why we're not getting married. I understand why I'm not on the show anymore. But I'm going to stay here. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do this for, for myself. And I'm going to stay in the time. And she went, oh, we're getting married. And I remember thinking, if I could have just manipulated her without, if I could have said those words without feeling that I really wanted to do it, you know, the, I would have just said those words because I've said those words to people, you know, a, a, a million times. And uh, and so, of course, we <laughs> we did end up getting married at, at the time. But I'd really sat on that thing and it, it, it really saved my life. So I do credit her with that. And I'm very grateful. Oh, my God. What Tom, an amazing story. That, dude. That is amazing. You thought something altogether different was going to go on and there you go man it's uh then i don't have the number right but you were how long do you stay sober the that first go around decades first, uh, 19 years i was uh 19 years sober wow. and, uh 20 uh in 2008 and uh, i was riding my motorcycle on pvch over there and i got very cocky with my program you know man, arrogant oh and i remember saying to a lot of young guys because uh, that was during the opioid, you know, I'd say, uh, guys, I sponsored younger guys who were heroin opioid guys. I go, yeah, I never, that was never my thing. That's not my thing. My thing was cocaine and alcohol. That's, I would never. And, uh, uh anyway, I wrecked my motorcycle out there and, uh, broke my back. And I remember Fuck. laying on the highway and I could hear the ambulance coming and the guy gets out of the ambulance. He said, are you in pain? And I said, uh, yes, he goes, well, not anymore. And pulled out a needle of uh, fentanyl and gave me a shot. I was like, I remember go thinking, oh, shit. No, that's what I needed about. Oh. That's what I was wrong about all that other stuff. And so a year later, I'm getting ready to take a 20-year cake, you know, my 20. And I, I realized, oh, I am still on the pain medication from <laughs> way back uh, a year ago. Like, that's, I am not sober. I'm going to eat this cake because I'm a glutton, but then I'm going to start <laughs> over. Then you're going to uh, start over. So you had to, okay. You, oh my God, dude. Oh my God, Tom. That's, I mean, God bless you. Um, And it's interesting to me that you've continued, you, you have said that you've continued to attend 12 step meetings since the beginning uh, of your journey. Does this include when you were drinking and using or how did that work? Well, you know, it certainly included when I was on opioids. Because <laughs> I didn't know. I convinced myself I was sober. Yeah. Well, you, got, you got a little, you got some pain. And then continuing, I have always got, it's the thing that has saved my life is uh, uh, always got a 12 step meeting. You know, and I, I think I went to my first in 1986 when I still lived in Minneapolis. And, it, it, you know, I'd go, I had 90 days, I'd do this, I'd do that, I'd celebrate, get some blow. Uh, you know, I didn't oh, really get it. I did really get it. But uh, uh, in, in, two, uh, in 1990, I started a, a, a meeting at my house, which is still goes on today. And I, a uh, great group of uh, uh, men and women at first, and then, and then the guys are like, we need to make it, we need to make this meeting uh, stag because there's too many young women coming because I have famous friends. I go, you go, Tom, you need to tell the women they can't come anymore. I go, I, I'm not capable of that. Oof. But you'll have, what we'll do is we'll say the meeting is moving. And my, a buddy of mine who was so, just got sober, an attorney, we have to move the meeting to your house because I can't tell these women who've been coming to the meeting, oh, now where you're not, you know. So, uh, but the, the, the meeting is, you know, I did a, it's Tuesday night. I did a Zoom with everybody. What day is it? This to last Tuesday. You know, things change, uh, you know, but, but yeah, uh, sure. I, I, I like to speak at variety of meetings. There's some hardcore meetings. You know, there's a lot of good sobriety out here, as you guys probably, you know, people are like, oh, it's all, it's all screwed up, everybody in Hollywood. There's uh, the excellent sobriety out here. So there's sure. no... There's no excuse. And when you do drugs, you think everybody does drugs. And then <laughs> well, when you stop, you stop, you assume nobody does. And uh, it's uh, so uh, but, uh, we're with you on that, man. We get it. 100%. Totally with you. And uh, we're the of the same era. So, I mean, this is, I'm the really same enjoying ilk. this. Um, I have a question. I've asked this. I've asked Casey this question too. Uh, a couple people here in the recovery community. Um, why do we 
this is just hypothetical, but why do we say we're in recovery instead of we're recovered? Oh, you know, because we're not recovered because uh, the first uh, moment we get, uh, we go, okay, we got this. And to normies, it makes sense. Like, why have you recovered? And I've had people write things about me. Uh, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I think uh, if you take your eye off the prize, you know, you just have to accept this is the journey. This is who I am. There's no shame in it. There used to be shame in it. There's mm -hmm. no shame in it. Uh, uh, yeah. it, recovering is just the, the better. I, I mean, I wish there, and people are always trying to get pills or shots or whatever they, and bless them. I hope people try a million different things. Oh, wow. and say, I've recovered. Uh, I just know that not to be the case with me for sure. I appreciate that. Uh, you lost on a, you had a weight loss journey as well and a fitness journey. Was it something like 80 pounds? Well, I've always had a fitness journey. I've always had uh, uh, issues with weight. You know, I've, uh, I've lost a hundred pounds three times. And had wow. You know, uh, people are like, that's impressive. I, uh, and I'll tell you, it's good for you, but it, I always tell people it's not good for your skin actually to get so big. But yeah, what I would always do is I'd go and especially after I left Iowa, when you work at a meat packing plant, you could eat a certain style of food and have it not affect you. But then you're a comedian. You're still eating that much food. It, it catches up with you. And, right. You know, if I, I say, I grew up on a farm, you know, we worked our ass off, bail, hay, whatever. We ate like crazy people. But you can't do that in your adult life. So I had, uh, uh, and a lot of times I would be uh, trying to be sober and I didn't have the drugs or whatever, and I put on weight. I think a lot of people do that. Mm. You know, you see people that are just uh, skeletal, and then they, they really, they get sober and they start putting on, which is great. You know, because nobody, uh, nobody wants to look skeletal. And not, it's great not to freak out about your weight. My first year of sobriety, my sponsor said, eat anything you want, smoke cigarettes, whatever. Just don't drink or do drugs. And year two, we will work on the other thing. Wow. So uh, Roseanne and I went to uh, it, all over Europe eating. <laughs> Gained so much weight. But uh, uh, I lost that weight three times. And, the, and what I would do, because I'm from Iowa, and wrestling is huge there, Mm. I would have a goal weight, meet it, meet that goal weight, and then it's on again. Like uh -huh. a second, I hit my goal weight. Like wrestlers, they rest, uh, they weigh it for a beat. They they get their weight, and then they gorge before their beat, even to give up the energy. So that was my thing. The last one was uh, about two years ago, and I was in the other room, give the kids a bath, and and I always say it's hard to to get uh, your kids in the bathtub, it's hard to get them out, you know. And we were on a time crunch. We are on a time crunch. So I'm like, bat, we got to take baths. as a school night. Uh, okay, oh, yeah. For, whoever gets in the bathtub first wins, so they both get in. I'd run, I'd run the water, which is great. I just kind of, okay, hose them off. And, and then they were playing, and they have the basketball set up there, and they're playing. And I go, okay, I'm going to – I do the thing where I turn around to the bathroom door, and I count to 10. Whoever gets out first wins. So I, I do that. They are counting to 10. And when I turn back around, uh, my right eye, uh, it, it felt like it looked like a curtain came down. And so I could not see anything out of it. And so oh. I thought, well, that's weird. My head, my brain felt a little weird, too. But I get the kids out. Uh, you know, I thought maybe I'd punch myself in the eye when I was counting or and, uh, I get them to bed. And then part of my vision comes back, the upper half of my right eye. Mm. So I am supposed to leave town in the morning to go to Alaska to film a, a show. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I went on Google to see what it could be, of course. Of course. Motor. I thought, you know what I'm going to do? When I get to Fairbanks, I'll deal with it. <laughs> it's oh, crazy. And I, and then I thought, wait a minute. I, you know, I'm a father with young kids. I'll tell you what, I, on the way to the airport, I'll stop by my, my eye doctor. So I did. They shot some uh, dye in me. And then he came back and said, uh, you had a stroke. I go, oh, God damn it. Oh. Yeah, you always assume you're going to hear that, but you don't want to hear that. So he said, you have to go to UCLA for a 24-hour stroke protocol. And uh, my big concern was uh, my manager getting hold of the director and give me another day. So don't tell him what's going on. Just give me another day. So I go over there, and uh, I'm very grateful that I have a, a, a great uh, medical thing. I have a heart cap for kids, and, and people are like, Wow, it's that's very uh, <laughs> nice of you. I go, no, no, it's nice for me because oh. you get to know the great doctors. Right, right. 
they uh, you lay there in the ER and they're they're like, uh, well, there's a list of strokes one through ten, and each one getting worse. They go, well, which stroke did you have? I go one, thank God, because you get to like number seven, you're all like, oh shit. So oh shit, dude. <laughs> Got in some blood thinners, but I also realized, well, I'm a hundred, I'm 285 pounds. That's not, that's not okay. And during COVID, you know, the kids were homeschooled, and it, you know, if you don't take your shirt off in front of anybody but your kids, there, there's not a lot of pressure to look. So I said, I got it. It's time to do this thing. Yeah. And, and I, the trainers I'd met at Arnold Schwarzenegger said, always oh, said, well, we'd like to work with you. I go, ah, not. Uh, I'll let you know. And so I called the guy. Uh, um, and uh, he, um, we started doing Zoom every couple weeks. And he's worked with very big people. He works with doctors. A lot of doctors get huge, as you guys know. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, his name. so he would say, here's what I want you to eat, when to eat it, and weigh in. And then by summer, this was January, February of 2022, and in the summer, I was going to be filming a thing with Arnold. I, he said, what's your goal? I go, I'd like to be my original True, true Lies weight when I build that and he goes oh yeah that'll happen i go i could not fathom it but i took a leap of faith i did what he said you know started my kids started letting me do cardio you know um i started doing it and by the summer i'd lost 80 uh 80 pounds which is crazy and i i remember i think at all time this is just it seems impossible but i will do this thing and I will change the way I eat. By the way, it's it's a lot about what we put in our mouths. We'll say, oh, I did uh, this exercise or whatever. Or or, or I've ever used to tell my dietitian what I didn't eat that day. No. You know what I could have eaten, but I did it. So, you know, I had all kinds of food uh, things. And uh, so it's something that I, I, I work on every day. You know, it's like a program. It's like I'm fully capable. You know, it was Christmas. Uh, we had Hanukkah and Christmas for yeah. us. New Year's, there's a lot of food around here. I blame my kids. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. You know, Halloween is the worst because I don't, I won't throw food away. I have this thing my dad had. Like, if they don't eat something, uh, I'm like, okay, I got to eat that. I got to, so I can blame them. At Halloween, <laughs> uh, they don't have to hide their candy that night because I'll walk, I'm a night eater. I'll get, a, I'll realize, oh, did I get up last night and eat? I'll find, find my mouth guard on the kitchen table. I go, oh, I did. I went to the, to the fridge. So I have, uh, <laughs> That, you know, I have to stay on top of that like everything else. Yeah. Knock on wood. Damn right. Oh, man. my God. And you've been a, you are a single parent. Uh, and uh, would you, the, the kids were the motivating factor for this last time and your health as well. How's, how's single hey, parenting go? Yeah. And, and beyond that, you know, seven years ago, uh, from a, a week ago, maybe, I was on a plane to South Africa. I, I needed money. You know, we were, I was going through this. And I, I decided to do this show that would not air in America. It's like one of those, I'm a celebrity, whatever. The cameras not work. And the idea was I, you flew over the biggest game reserve uh, in the world. And you jumped out of a plane with nothing. And I'm like, I'm, okay, I'll do that. And uh, before I went, I thought, well, you know, what what do I need? I And, you know, I was kind of thinking as my own doctor. And I thought, I need some Xanax. That's, if I'm going to be in the middle of no, who knows it's gonna be hard first time i've ever been away with my kids I, so i thought i should get some i should get 90 10 milligram that's the only thing i stuck in there with me and and, and benzos i'm gonna tell you something man oh. uh getting off of uh, opioids or alcohol or, or uh, cocaine you know that yeah you know, obviously that could be done but getting i couldn't get off of the benzos so i got back like i stopped taking them and it was so weird and so I went back to my my uh, third rehab for you know to deal with this Oof. benzo thing, and I get in there like it's not a real problem. I think it's just maybe uh, psychological. I get in there, and a guy from my home group uh, uh, you're not supposed to read the internet, but of course I broke that rule. But um, uh, I uh, uh, Chris Cordell, who I've known many years, oh. very sweet guy, very funny, great musician. He had hung himself. Yeah, and he was on. I, I called his wife. I go, "What is going on?" And it was Benzos, and he had taken him. He was on the road. He was feeling. He was not quite. He obviously worked at his program, and he had a workout band on the uh, knob of his uh, bathroom, wherever hotel he was in. And I knew because I know how when you're on Benzos, you like 
have this second alternate uh, reality where you see that thing hanging there, that band, and you're like, I could hang myself that. Yeah, that oh, goes to your head, but you're not, you're not saying I want to hang myself. And then one time, uh, uh, you you just do it because you're in that. It's sort of like a movie. Mm. And he got to an argument with his wife, and he was she busted him on the benzos. And he was freaking out and said she's going to talk to a sponsor or whatever. And he just he hung himself. It's a you know, I mean that certainly could could have been me. It's a it's it's hideous the benzos. Let me tell you something, man. Oh my god, you know, people people you know, and a lot of times people die now. There it's opioids and benzos. I yeah, mean, they you know they. They go well. There's fentanyl in, his, in the system, or whatever. And, but there's also benzos, and people don't. Even, they don't acknowledge that. It's a. They, for all I know, that's what Matthew Perry. Uh, um, he de- he definitely. <laughs> besides him being his own doctor, I mean, he's a great guy. And I've known him many years from yeah. the, our common disease. But I, I think he be he decided to become his own doctor too, and, he, and his doctor killed him. Oh. That's all. That's oh <laughs> shit, man. Yeah. Terribly tragic, I might say. Um, oh my God, Tom! Golly, brother. listen, uh, I t- we totally appreciate you taking as much time as you did. You. And uh, uh, future plans for Tom Arnold? Uh, I'm going to make my kids something to eat in a minute, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind enough to to uh, uh, and, you know I. I you know, our, our, I need to work, you know, I'm going to turn, uh, my big, big plan is hopefully, knock on wood, turning 65, March 6, and people are like, are you, is it hard for you to get over? I go, I can't wait to, because I, I get Social Security, and I, the day I turn 65, I get to stop pay alimony. <laughs> it's like uh, minutes oh, right. <laughs> oh, my God. Is that a thing? I had no idea. That's awesome. That's amazing. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, and and la- so, I just love being alive. I'm so grateful for today for talking to you guys. Well, it's, and, uh, it's a pleasure. It's, going, going, going to David Butler's me and the kids. Like it's a, it's a great life. I don't uh, take it for granted. I don't take, uh, you know, having my kids for granted for sure. You know, because uh, oh, no. the, the issues I've had to deal with up there, Bob. Wow, but you know, it's great. And and I do remember uh, the last time I was there. I'm thinking, oh gosh. If I could just make it to, boy, if I could live to be 65, it's oh. crazy I'm alive. Like, it's crazy I'm alive that, but I thought that'll be a big day, you know, <laughs> that'll be, so well, there, it, I'm pretty, it but, I, but I, you know, my daughter had said, you know, daddy, how old will we be when I'm in uh, college? And I said, I'll be, I'll be 75. And she goes, I'm not going to college. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Honey, you don't have to go to college. Let me tell you something. Yeah. But, you know, uh, for just sure. a day at a time to live my life as a father and, and as a human and and uh because i i try not to get ahead of myself i get very dark place okay. going okay i think that happened that happened this happened. so just live in the moment with you guys thank you for doing this today thank i hope you. you guys i'll see you down there yes very excited Ab- to be tech absolutely to be, tom listen <laughs> listen this this is a sidebar but i just have to ask how did the meeting go when you were introduced or, or you introduced each other to Arnold? Was it Tom Arnold, Arnold Tom? No, I do. I do. That's funny. Anyway, yeah, yeah. thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your day. You too. We'll see you guys soon. See you right. soon. Thank you so much, Thank you, Tom. Tom. Take care, brother. Okay, so how cool was that to have Tom take the time to hang with the Yale brothers today? Thanks, Tom Arnold want to thank our friends for listening i'm chris yale roger yale has left the building (laughs) if you want to get in touch with us it's yalebrothers at gmail.com one more thing to say rock and roll